Broadcasting from the Investor Hour studios and all around the world, you're listening to the Stansberry Investor Hour. Tune in each Thursday on iTunes, Google Play, and everywhere you find podcasts for the latest episodes of the Stansberry Investor Hour. Sign up for the free show archive at InvestorHour.com. Here's your host, Dan Ferris. Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm your host, Dan Ferris. I'm also the editor of Extreme Value, published by Stansberry Research. This week, we'll talk with Mike McGlone, commodity strategist at Bloomberg. In the mailbag today, questions about books, gold, Bitcoin, and the Federal Reserve. Remember, you can call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. For my opening rant this week, I'm going to talk about how to absolutely destroy your portfolio. <laughs> that and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. Well, why would I tell you how to destroy your portfolio? Well, I'm referring very specifically to a really interesting blog post by a firm called SL Advisors, a guy named Simon Lack at SL Advisors, sl-advisors.com. And it's called ARK's Investors Have In Aggregate Lost Money. And of course, ARK is um, ARK Investment Management run by a woman named Kathy Wood. She founded the firm in 2014 based on the idea of investing in disruptive, innovative companies. Right, companies engaged in disruptive innovation. And of course, post COVID, these funds took off the ARK Innovation. I think ARK Innovation ETF, which has like 60% of the firm's assets, it was up something like 150%. It soared like a skyrocket. It was incredible. And then it crashed. But what, what Simon Lack has found out, he looked at the fund flows and realized. And this is typical. That's why I'm telling you about it. What he found is typical. Most of the money in it came in around the top. So that, you know, in the aggregate, he says, the fund has, on average, everyone in the fund has lost money. The average dollar invested in, in the ARK Innovation ETF, he says, has lost money. Because most of the money in came in at the top. And that's what happens. This is a microcosm of what happens in a raging speculative bull frenzy. At the top is when everyone thinks this is a wonderful idea. That's why it's the top. Because after everyone thinks that, there's nobody left. <laughs> and, and there's nowhere to go but down. But the flows into stocks were higher in 2021. This was covered by a number of of news sources were higher in 2021. The flows into equity funds in 2021 were higher than the previous 20 years combined, right? So we're setting ourselves up. Investors are setting themselves up um, to be, you know, net destroyed, net at their whole, you understand what, what this means. This means by getting so excited and putting tons more money in, you know, during the top of a speculative frenzy, your whole portfolio winds up at a loss, right? You say, well, you could say, well, you know, sure, I invested in the in the bull market and, and through the top and everything, but I've been investing for years and years. So, you know, I'm going to be okay. All those other investments I made in previous years, they'll still be okay. Well, that may be true, but if you have participated more heavily, if you've gotten really excited, as many people do, I might even say most people do, because that's how these episodes happen, then you could be setting yourself up for, you know, to wipe out all of your gains, to have your portfolio at a net loss. And you don't want that. You don't want to have invested for 20 or 30 years and then be holding a net loss because you got way too excited and put way too much money into a bunch of speculative garbage right at the top. Okay? And like I said, this, this there's a really neat blog post over at sl-advisors.com called 
ARK investors have in aggregate lost money. And I would recommend that you read it because it illuminates, it does the math kind of on a phenomenon that is, this is the reason why I've been bearish for four years. Believe me, being bearish does me no good in the newsletter business. It prevents me from selling newsletters, right? It prevents me from, from selling anything. Like, you know, my publisher probably hates that I've been so bearish, um, you know, mostly bearish for four years, bullish during, you know, at the bottom in the COVID crash, but mostly bearish. And certainly for the, you know, since like late 2020. And it, you know, it's no fun. But you got to do it when things are this crazy and this speculative and this expensive. And the reason that I've been okay with doing that, besides the fact that it's the right thing to do, is that I'm trying to save all my listeners and readers from exactly what Simon Lack at SL Advisors has spelled out for us in black and white in this blog post. You pour money in at the top, you pour too much money in at the top. And in the aggregate, you'll wind up losing. Your whole portfolio will wind up in the red. It's awful. So be careful. Be careful out there. And, you know, the opposite of that um, was covered by a guy named Eric Cinnamond. Eric, if you're out there, I'd love to have you on the show. I think we've invited you once or twice. And and so far, you you're, haven't gotten back to us. But Eric is at Palm Valley Capital Management, palmvalleycapital.com. And he puts out a fun letter that anybody can read. And, you know, he made the point in his most recent letter that they don't buy all that expensive garbage. So, you know, they they miss out on the upside, but they also miss out on the downside. And he says, when record valuations and profits are soaring ever higher from the government's money cannons and value is scarce, we'll trade upside opportunity for downside mitigation. The bigger the bubble, the bigger the ultimate mess. Happy New Year, he says after that. So I agree with that. Okay. So be careful out there. I think Mike McGlone's message um, that, that he's going to give us today in the interview is one you should listen to. I've been reading his stuff, so I know what he's thinking. And, and I'll let him spell it out for you. And, um, you know, the, I'm giving you a hint, obviously, with talk, talking about um, SL Advisors and Palm Valley Capital, their message. But just just be careful out there these days. Don't be so eager to speculate and try to make big, fast money. Let's leave it at that. And let's go ahead right now and talk with Mike McClone, our guest today. Let's do it right now. Tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, we're airing an emergency briefing. In short... The NASDAQ just saw its worst week in almost a year. And according to our analyst, Greg Diamond, the year 1932 holds the key to what will happen next in 2022. 90 years of evidence points to a nasty event in 2022, Greg says. Keep in mind, this is the same guy who predicted the 2020 crash to the exact week and whose recommendations could have helped you double your money 26 different times without buying a single stock. Tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern, he's sharing the biggest prediction of his career. If you know what's coming, it could be a once in seven years money-making opportunity. But if you do nothing, Greg believes you could lose most or all of what you've made in the market since 2020, thanks to an event backed by 90 years of evidence. If you own stocks, you can't afford to miss tonight's event. You can reserve a free spot right now at www.messagefromgreg.com. That's message from G-R-E-G, messagefromgreg.com. And by the way, if you plan to skip tonight's event, at the very least, you can claim a free crash survival kit. It contains the ticker symbols of three stocks that Greg believes will see the biggest move in 2022. You can claim that crash survival kit at messagefromgreg.com. And again, we go live at exactly 8 p.m. Eastern tonight with a must-see prediction from the man who predicted the 2020 crash, along with the exact date he believes stocks will crash, and a free recommendation to play it that could double your money. So just go to www.messagefromgreg.com, messagefromgreg.com, and if you happen to be listening to this after Thursday, January 13th, don't worry. You can still visit messagefromgreg.com right now to get the full details 
of what could be the worst crash since 2008. Okay, time for our interview once again. Uh, today's guest is Mike McGlone. Mike is a senior commodity strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence, a unique research platform that provides context on industries, companies, and government policy available on the Bloomberg Professional Service at BI. Mr. McGlone specializes in the broad investable commodity markets. He joined Bloomberg in 2016 with over 25 years of futures and commodity trading and investing experience, beginning at the Chicago Board of Trade. Wow. Mike, welcome to the show. Hello, Dan. Thank you. 25 years of futures and commodity trading starting at Chicago Board of Trade will teach you a thing or two, won't it? <laughs> yeah, it's nothing like getting your face ripped off by markets a little bit once in a while. I, actually, it's uh, quite a bit more than 25 years. I started in 1988, but no, it's a, I, you'd think, I hope I learned a few things and hopefully we can bring that out in the interview. Yeah, but, but before we do that, though, Mike, like, I'm sure like almost none of our listeners have access to a Bloomberg terminal. A few of them do, for sure. Um, I know they do, but can you describe like what is the Bloomberg Intelligence Service? When you get into Bloomberg, you type BI. What what what's that all about? Well, it's the it's the research arm of the terminal. The unique thing we do here is that I find wonderful is we're completely unbiased. I sit in front of this data dissemination machine all day, all we you know, all twenty four seven, and I come up with the best research I can without a you know the heavy hand of being on the sell side and buy side, influencing my views. So they're completely unbiased. I need editors, as we'll see by the end of this interview. I'm more of a south side Chicago Dem Deeds and Doze guy, which is my connection with Chicago Board of Trade. But that's what we are. We're basically the research arm of Bloomberg. And that's the advantage we have is um, this machine, I'm completely unbiased. And there's a bunch of us who are more senior who just, my main job is put out research as profound as I can to help investors make the decisions. And the cool thing is it trickles down to events and things like we're doing right now. Um, and this is, this to me is like the show and tell. It's the fun part of the job. Oh, I totally agree. Yeah. Who knew having, you know, getting old would be so valuable, huh? <laughs> um, so you wrote a, a pretty cool piece with kind of a cool title recently. And it was called Bitcoin, Ethereum dollars, and 16,000 wannabes versus the Fed. Um, let's, let's talk about that because there's a lot going on in this piece. But maybe, maybe you could just sort of tie the whole thing up and generalize a little bit, and then we'll get down into some of what you said in it. Good. Well, I think it's a great start. That's, that's basically my January cryptos outlook um, published the first week of the year. And it's the main focus, I think, that people need to, that we should be focused on for cryptos in 2022. And that's the three musketeers of cryptos. That's the prolifer or the advancing prices of Bitcoin and Ethereum and the proliferation of crypto dollars. And so I'll dig into that a little bit. I fully expect the price of Bitcoin to continue to increase in value um, versus dollars. Ethereum to do the same, although it's kind of got a little bit ahead, got a little bit, maybe got a little bit too overdone 2021. And the most yeah. significant part of that statement too also is crypto dollars. People call them stable coins, but it's the most significant fact of the digitalization in cryptography and, and all this crypto, this crypto market that people are not aware of. And that's the proliferation of crypto dollars. So there's this term called stable coins. That to me is misnamed. Virtually all these so-called stable coins, almost all of them track dollars. It's basically crypto dollars. So and they're most widely traded. Tether's just one of them. And then there's a dozen wannabes. And that's basically the ability to transmit, transact, transport um, dollars 24-7 on a global basis without having to use a bank and earn interest. And I say 16,000 wannabes because that's the total number of crypto, so-called cryptocurrencies listed on coinmarketcap.com. Last year was 8,000. A year before that was 4,000. So the simple rules of economics, ease of entry, and massive supply do not bode well for overall market. Um, but there is a three stalwarts, and that is um, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and the proliferation of crypto dollars. Yeah, I own, I own two of those. I own Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, you touched on something about Bitcoin 
Well, you sort of sort of refer to it. The the idea that that which I've noticed is that Bitcoin trades it trades like a risk on risk off typical risky asset, and yet we all recognize we own it because we think it has this. Uh, you know, it's compared to gold all the time. It has this ability to become a store of value and maybe even an actual currency. What does it look like to you? Does the, the fact that, that Bitcoin trades in this risk on risk off manner bother you? Oh, no. It was, to me, the Bitcoin is in the price discovery stage of a nascent technology slash asset that's mm-hmm. gaining adoption in a world that's going digital. That describes Bitcoin. It's the benchmark digital property right. So do we expect that trend to uh, flatten out, to accelerate, or to to diminish? I fully expect it to continue to accelerate. And the way I like to describe it is the, the main my main focus macro for this year is long risk assets is fighting the Fed. The Fed will tighten and continue to tighten um, and increase decrease liquidity until and or unless the stock market goes down. That's just the way it works in history. Bitcoin, uh, cryptos are some of the riskiest assets. It's just Bitcoin is the least risky among the assets. And the, the significance, I think, is Bitcoin is at the cusp of transitioning from a risk on asset to a risk off digital store of value, value of global collateral. Now, that's something I've been saying for at least a year. And I think it's happening, and that's part of my premise for this year, that I fully expect the Fed to just take away the punch bowl, be careful fighting the Fed, but Bitcoin to come out ahead. Um, and I think it's more likely the stock market's going to likely to come out. I don't think people figured it out yet that there's only one way to slow down inflation. You have to stall, stop, or reverse the advancing um, prices of virtually all assets. That's the only way to really do it. And the Fed is starting to do it. Actually, no, they haven't even started. It. That's the shocker part. They haven't even started. It's just warning right. us. But uh, to me, the commodity market's already kind of taken the, the warning. They, it peaked in October last year. Now it's inching up to those highs. Uh, bond yields have already t- taken the, the hint. The, the 30-year peaked around 2.5% back in March and April, and now it's close to 2%. Um, and to me, that's what this year is going to be about is I think we're going to look back at it as we should have learned our lesson, don't fight the Fed. And the best thing can happen is, you know, we have some analysts are looking for up to six 25 basis point hikes this year. And to me, that's not going to happen because the market's going to do it for them. So the, Fed, the stock market will just decline or stop going up and, and kick in the deflationary forces that were in place before we had this COVID distortion in global um, and, and basically what was a predominant deflationary trend. Right. You and another couple of folks that I follow on Twitter have pointed out futures are pointing to 100 basis points, which would probably correspond to four four hikes in 2022. And even that sounds like a heck of a lot to me. It's a dream. I would love, I mean, as a commodity guy, you know, like, you know ex-pit guy, I would just love to see the demand pull of inflation and real demand pull inflation. Right now, it's just the Fed responding to the 40% increase in U.S. money supply since the beginning of 2020, um, the massive fiscal and monetary stimulus, all the above, and, and the expected inflation. So to me, what's happened is the game is over. We all know what started with the stock market crash in 90, 1987. The Fed just pumped the system with liquidity, liquidity every time the stock market goes down. That can last until inflation tells it they have to stop. It's, it's happened. Fed Chairman Powell said that. So let's, re, let's, let's focus first on the macro. We have an emboldened Federal Reserve Chairman. This is the same guy who pushed back on Donald Trump, who's been reappointed for his second term and has said in his last in his press conference for the December meeting said, I am more concerned about how history looks back at our decisions 25 years from now. He has to fight inflation and he's being responsible. And he all knows we're in a massive bubble. He's got the pricket. So they're gonna, right now we're in the jawboning state. So getting that, to me, that's what's happening with the macro. Um, And then you look at things like um, copper looks like it's peaked. Corn looks like it's peaked. Crude oil potentially has peaked. Commodities probably are, are understanding. Uh, bond yields probably have peaked, and the stock market is usually last. So my my outlook for this year is the uh, stock market's probably going to go down because the Fed's going to just jawbone until it does, and Bitcoin's going to come out ahead. Now that's a bit of a profound statement, I get it, um, but something's got to come out ahead so far, and I think um, uh, you know even bond yields might do better. But right now, you know, this first week, first couple of weeks of the year, virtually everything is under pressure. That's a huge call, actually, isn't it? 
that that Bitcoin is going to cease to be this risk on risk off asset and is going to start to show its true colors, what we hope are its true colors anyway, those of us who are long, um, is th that will be a sea change. This will be a huge moment if you're right. Yeah, so Bitcoin's gone through some major sea changes in the last year. So 2020 was the first year that really hit, struck me when Bitcoin volatility declined versus all assets on the planet were increasing. And at bottom, it went up. Last year, 2021 was the year it really jumped into the mainstream and company, con countries like El Salvador adopted it as a uh, um, legal tender. And China banned it to me that it showed its value. And to me, that's, and, and this year, I think we're going to look back at as Bitcoin really showed its appreciation. Now it's hovering around this $40,000 level, basically since March of 2021, almost a year now. And that's, to me, just a consolidating uh, bull market. And I love the, the things that you and I probably sense a lot in markets is when you see something that's an enduring, fundamentally strong bull market that's backed up and you sense pretty significant bear sentiment, that's just what you want to see. <laughs> you, mm -hmm. you don't want to see too yeah. much bull sentiment at extreme highs. You want to see bearish sentiment when you know fundamentals are good, just because you know the, the leverage, they, you know, leverage people are getting stopped out, and it just means the uh, the rightful owners will be snoop, scooping it up. And I think that's what's happening. So forty thousand yeah. to me, Bitcoin. Worst case, I think we have a major swoon, maybe it goes to thirty. But to me, it's just a matter of time that it gets to hundred thousand dollars. And part of that is just observing the serious. We know that it's it's the demand versus supply and adoption. Supply is just set in code. It's just from a commodity guy. It's one of the most unique things I've ever I've ever seen. Nine hundred coins a day period, until 2024, drops to 450, period, and then it, it halves again four years later. All that matters is, is demand and adoption. Now, demand is clearly increasing, and adoption to me is in very early days. Something has mm -hmm. to trip up that adoption trend, and I only see more institutional demand every day, and greater risk for people are still on zero. And I'll leave you with this. The key fact is there is clearly outflows in gold investments and inflows into in investments in Bitcoin. That's clearly a fact. The question is, do I expect that to accelerate or reverse? And I think it's more of the same. Trend stays the same, but more likely to accelerate. Are the flows, why you, you, you talked about bonds and Bitcoin and gold, and you said Bitcoin was the highest quality. Is that why? Well, I'd say it's, it's the highest, um, it's the highest, greatest risk. It's the greatest 260-day volatility. It's usually around 70%. But... I think it has the greatest, we all know, it, is, it has been one of the best performance in assets in history, and I don't see why I should change that view. It's more likely to continue that performance, albeit, albeit at a slower pace, lower volatility. But that was kind of my call I started making oh, well, a little less than a year ago. Is that assets, I think, is a, a unique combination, I think, is Bitcoin, long bonds, and gold. Because I don't know for sure if gold's going away, but overall history proves that you should be buying gold in these types of environments. Um, but it's, it is being replaced by Bitcoin, so I just can't put all my assets, assets, you know, eggs in one basket. And then there's long bonds. It's it's a narrative I've loved, Dan. Is I've been you know long bond guy for my almost my whole career, starting in the bond trading pits in the '80s in, in the Chicago Board of Trade. Got to New York because I correctly called the, call. the bond the bond bull market. And here's my narrative I like to say about the U.S. bond market. The consensus, absolute, complete consensus last year was U.S. bond yields have to go higher. That's been wrong yep. so far. I mean, it's up a little bit, but since yep. the long bond peaked at 2.5%, I like to point out, okay, it's declining. Despite all these consensus, it should go higher. And I'm like, what are people missing about just looking at a long-term chart? Bond yields have been declining for 40 years. I used to trade JGB. So some people say, I, I, it's a weird thing when people, I say that people will say, what's that? I'm like, okay, I guess you haven't been around as long as I have. Japanese government bonds. And I traded them in the <laughs> I remember when I first was selling and trading them, and every one of my, I was trading in sales, all the customers says, I'm short and I'm happy. They were all wrong. Then I heard similar in European bonds because JGBs went to negative yields, European bonds went to negative yields. And my quote is, I fully expect the US 10 year note yield is going to go negative, and it's one stock bear market away from doing that. Now, we have not had a stock bear market since the 2008 to 2011 correction, I have not had one. And we're overdue for now. How you define a bear market? I don't know, because <laughs> they get different every time. You know, the, the consensus is prices will never go down, but to me, that's what's going to happen. And that's why I view the long bond is still attractive um, for investment portfolio, and it's also completely against consensus. And I just click on my terminal. I put put on that long bond 
chart. I go back 40 years and I see it's been going down for 40 years and I'm just not smart enough to pick a bottom in that. Because there's a long-term trend in bond yields is down. There's a long-term trend in the adoption, early days in price of Bitcoin, it's up. And I suspect, and then there's this issue with the rule of life. As you and I both know, don't fight the Fed. And anybody who's long risk assets, most known in the stock market right now, is fighting the Fed. They have to raise rates. They will jawbone until inflation goes down. And the number one way to make inflation go down is this massive increase in asset prices has to stop or reverse. It's hard for me, maybe because my, my you know, the bulk of my career in, in and around the finance industry has been spent during the time of a accommodative slash hyper accommodative Fed. And it's really difficult for me to believe to see to see them getting away. We saw what happened in 2018, right? And it seems like if they if they go in and do whatever you know, if they make the futures markets prediction come true and they do four hikes and we're up 100 basis points, you know, the market will hate it and they'll take it all back and then some. Then you'll be at your negative, uh, you know, nominal yield. Exactly. So let's just let's use a hypothetical. The stock market drops 10 percent. What does that do for inflation? Nothing. Doesn't mean anything. No, I don't think so. So they have to keep raising rates. And we haven't had this 10% correction since the soon in 2020. That's what scares me about all assets. I look at the Bloomberg Commodity Index. Since it peaked, at, it's about the same level it was in 2008, a little bit higher. It dropped 50%. went back around that level around 2014, then dropped 50% again. What? What's the rule in commodities? It's secure, higher prices. What stops that from happening? I think it fully is going to happen again. And now you have the Fed saying, well, we're going to just raise rates until we get back to our inflation targets. They have to do this. And one of the leading indicators for inflation is commodity. And one of the leading indicators of inflation is the bond market, but the 30-year bond is looking ahead. So I, I view this mm -hmm. as just there's terms in the life where you're supposed to just the bells ring, and I think the bells ringing for risk assets. And the Fed just said it. Right. And also, and I also so, lose my example of when I was pumping gas in 1979 in Chicago. I was a gas jockey, and the price went. You remember this? Remember it went from a half a gallon? I'm sorry for up to over a dollar a gallon, and we had oh, a. Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I remember I was a gas jockey. I'm like, okay, so what are we going to do? We, our pumps could not go above a dollar. Imagine the engineering of these things. They never thought it'd go above a dollar a gallon. So we had a price at half a gallon. To me, that's that's the inflation we're having in the 70s. I remember it. And people say it's different this time. Yeah, it is. I think fully expect technology is going to um, pressure inflation and continue to do it. But right now, where's our inflation? Asset price. And owner's equivalent rent, which is directly related to housing. So, Mike, you're you're the commodities guy, and I agree that you know the commodities index, the GSCI, ripped in 2021. So we, we expect a correction. But what do you think longer term? If you, if you think inflation is in the offing, don't you have to be more bullish longer term? The, the rule about commodities is um, one of the best times in history by commodities was on the 2020 swoop. We've had a double basically. You mentioned GSCI index. It um, I used to manage that index at S and P, <laughs> and it's very energy heavy. So the problem with, um, with that is let's just look at its most significant co commodity, crude oil. Crude oil is about half the price of the peak in 2008. That's not good. <laughs> Why? Because there's more supply, less demand. We use less of it. And just look at it 10 years ago. We're all going to be driving electric vehicles. We might not want to, but it's just going to be more cost effective. Just, I already have an electric car. It's great. It runs great. And it's more cost effective than any car I've ever had. Now, I bought that eight years ago. Um, Chevy Volt. But the key thing about commodities, remember, it's a pr higher price cure. And that's the big difference is we are right now almost, at least for most of the last year, we are double the cost of U.S. shale um, production. It's basically got down to $40 a barrel. Now it's $50 a barrel. And that's significant because that's the, been the primary pressure factor on commodities for the last 10 years. It's U.S. going from the world's largest importer of crude oil to now a net export of liquid fuels. So the problem with commodities and being bullish for inflation is that higher price cure will pressure them. But they're not really what's driving inflation now. In the past, yes, it did. What's really driving these inflation figures from the Fed are owner equivalent rent, employment cost index, things that are not really directly related to commodities. And we all see it. Like I was just on the call with a good friend of mine who's out in, in Illinois talking about the massive bid in pharma. And his point out, point out to me, it's up 30 to 40% in over a year. And okay, what's the money supply down? <laughs> Yeah. But mm -hmm. the thing about um, farmland is you can't make more of it. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't have the higher price cure as much as something like crude oil. You can create more of it. And it's been um, technologies replacing it. And that's why I look Maybe at my, 
maybe tell our listeners what you mean by higher price cure. Yeah, it's the rule of commodities is um, the, the cure for higher prices is higher prices. And that showed up clearly in corn last year. It got to near $7 a bushel. It got to over double the cost of production. More production came on. Prices go back down. It's all the rule of commodities. The number one rule also is markets usually peak um, when inventories are low and usually trough bottom when inventories are high. We have low crude oil inventories right now. That's, and the best leading indicator are the grains. It really starts in the grains. Why? Because you can bring on supply in one year. So um, that's the number one rule about um, trying to hedge inflation with commodities. And then, of course, you have to roll futures, and it's a pain. That's where gold kind of kicks in. That's why gold has had that enduring bid in terms of overall historically advancing um, relative to the price of dollars because it has limited supply. So I'll give you an example, and that is, first of all, the most significant commodity, crude oil, is about half the price of the peak for a reason, because prices, OPEC pressure prices made prices so high well, you know, to that peak in 2008, 2014, it incentivized the U.S. to bring in more shale, and a key fact is our consumption is declining and our production is increasing because of prices and technology. Now, one thing I want to leave you with is the best way sometimes to measure assets is versus gold. So average acre of farmland in Iowa has been about four acres, four ounces of gold for about 50 years, fluctuating between like three and five. The S&P 500 total return since I think it's 1994 or 84 has been about four ounces of gold over time. It just fluctuates. So what's really changing? Money supply. Um, and gold measures that. But what's changing now is there's no more interest rates, and the Fed's now increasing rates. It's the whole, to me, the game's over. But that's the bottom line from, I think, when you think about commodities and inflation and stuff, is if you're buying commodities to hedge inflation, you have to roll futures and things like that. I would say consider Bitcoin because you have the world's going digital, technologies pressuring commodity prices, and Bitcoin's part of that technology. And then you look at the other side, the other assets, stock market is the most expensive in history versus real estate, versus sales, versus global uh, and global um, the, the rest of the world stock market, and versus GDP, the Warren Buffett model. So don't fight the Fed. All right. You bit off a big, uh, a big bite there, but I, I think we got it. Um, so it sounds to me like um, don't fight the Fed right now at this moment means don't be too bullish on stocks. Yeah, period. well, it's, you know, I, I said this before, before the 2000, um, um, the, the, the soon we had in 2000, was it, uh, we had a little warning in 2018. And then, of course, 2020. And then, of course, we had, of course, we had the most significant amount of fiscal monetary stimulus in U.S. history. Of course, the stock market um, blasts up. I fully expected gold and Bitcoin would be outperforming, and Bitcoin did. But now we're at that stage where there is, we have the greatest amount of stock ownership percentage-wise in the U.S. ever. I mentioned how expensive it is. And the Fed just said, sorry, we got to raise rates. And most people in the market have not seen this type of history where, you know, like I said, it, Inflation's at the highest rate since when I was pumping gas in 1979. <laughs> it's like they, they, the chairman has to raise rates. The thing is, the best thing I look at what Chairman Powell said is um, he's looking at for 25 years from now. I think that what they're doing right now is if, let's, let's put ourselves forward in history. If they just jawbone and never have to raise rates a lot, just jawbone, the market's correct, inflation declines, and um, basically have that high base effect kicks in, which I fully expect will. Stay, stay, let's say we get a 20% correction in the stock market. In the, in the past, it used to be considered normal. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> let's say we get that. All, all, all bets are off. Everything's out. The Fed probably will not have to tighten. That inflationary trend will probably be over. We probably will not see the fiscal and monetary stimulus we've seen. Because of inflation, the mar markets will stabilize. So the, everything, everything will be equalized, normalized, and I think solved with a 20% correction in the stock market. The question is, how is it happening? When has it happened? So that solves the problem. If it keeps going up 20%, what do we have? More inflation. All right, Mike. Um, I know you have another call that you want to get to, but I like the way when I ask you a question, you really scoop up a lot of insight into your answer. So I want to give you plenty of time to, to deal with my final question, which is the same, you know, and sometimes I follow up. So maybe it's like penultimate question, <laughs> but 
But this, it's the same final question for every guest, no matter what the topic every, on the podcast, every episode. And that is simply, if you could leave our listeners today with a single thought, what would it be and why? Don't fight the Fed. Risk assets, are, long risk assets are fighting the Fed. And one of the least cryptos are the riskiest of assets. And Bitcoin is the least risky among cryptos, well on its way becoming the global digital collateral. Right. Now, that's an interesting answer, considering your prediction for, uh, for, for Bitcoin for the year 2022. Well, it's, right? I, I, I mean, expect Bitcoin to outperform in this period of Fed taking away, basically the game over from the Fed. You sit Fed signaling the game's over since the, 2000, uh, the 1987 stock market crash. They have to restrain by their, their laws. They have to push back on inflation, and they can. They have the power to do it. Paul Volcker proved it. We know it can, it can easily be done, um, but the stock market could do it for them. Right. So outperformance of Bitcoin could include, you know, down 5% with the stock market down 20 or 30, right? Oh, oh, sure. Well, if the stock market goes down, if it goes down 20%, Bitcoin will go down. I fully expect that. But remember what mm -hmm. happened with gold in 2008? You know, it hit exactly. stops. And, yeah. And then it comes back and it goes on an enduring 10-year 10 market, 10 year bull market. That can easily happen. To me, that's the kind of thing we should look forward to. This is the major reset. Maybe we'll get lucky and this inflation turns to be more transitory. I fully expect that will kick in, but we're at the stage right now. I think the bottom line for our listeners is do not fight the Fed. Uh, the game is probably over, and the facts are there. The, we have the highest inflation in 40 years. The Fed has to pull back, has to restrain. This is not just – this is quantitative tightening. This is a responsible thing for the Fed to do. It has to do that. The market mm -hmm. could do it for them, though. Right, and it's worth pointing out then – that round trip from peak of S&P 500, October 2007 to trough March 2009, gold was, act was higher at the end of that than at the beginning. It was, a, it, was, it was a tough trip, but higher at the end. We could see something similar for Bitcoin then maybe. Yeah. So remember gold bottomed around $70, $700 an ounce and then peaked right. around what was that? I think it was right around 1900 almost 2000 1900 dollars an ounce in 2013 mm -hmm. 12 13 so it had a pretty good run and then kind of marked the end of the gold bull run now gold was at the end kind of more of the end of a bull run at the time it was up for 20 years or so started 2000 oh, so it was up 10 years sorry i have my time but now we have the situation where i think we've had a pretty significant time correction in bitcoin and it's replacing gold that was we didn't have gold a bitcoin back then so um, it's a new world. And, yeah, and my job is to try to be ahead. And being ahead means you get you lose your hair sometimes, but that's just the way it is. And here's the, the facts. Bottom line are, facts are, it's just, I can't say enough. Long risk assets is fighting the Fed. All right. I think that's a good place to leave our listeners. I think that sums up your view really nicely. Listen, Mike, thanks for being here. And I'm really curious. We've got to have you back, you know, Maybe end of the year, middle of the year. We have to update this view. You know, you made a huge call on Bitcoin. So um, it'll be great to have you back and, and see what you say, you know, I don't know, nine or 12 months or something from now. I'm looking forward to it. All right, Mike. Thanks very much. Well, you heard the man. <laughs> you heard the man clearly. Don't fight the Fed at this moment in time. January 2022 means uh, be careful about risk assets. You know, be careful about um, doing all the things that worked so incredibly well last year, right? You couldn't go wrong just sort of buying every dip in stocks and commodities last year. And it sounds like Mike thinks you will go wrong doing that starting right now. Uh, it's an interesting view, his view on Bitcoin. I've never heard anyone say that. If, if that happened, if Bitcoin sort of transitions from a, a risk on asset to a risk off asset, that is something that people buy as a safe haven uh, rather than you know trading to trying to make quick money, that will be a huge moment. We will look back in time and say, wow, 2022 was the most amazing moment for Bitcoin. It really turned out to be true. Everything that we thought Bitcoin would do, it started doing it for, for real in 2022. That, I, you know, I, I live every day and I don't want time to move any faster, but I can't wait to find out if Mike is right. All right. 
Let's take a look at the mailbag. Let's do it right now. If you own gold or gold stocks, please listen to this warning immediately. The man who predicted the 2020 crash sees major warning signs. An event in 2022 could have a massive impact on gold and other sectors. The man is Mark Chaikin, and he says, move your money in the early days of 2022. That means right now, folks. The last time Mark issued a public warning like this, the market went on to see its biggest one-day drop in history. To get the full details, visit www.2022tradingsystem.com. Again, that website is www.2022tradingsystem, all one word, 2022tradingsystem.com. Check it out. In the mailbag each week, you and I have an honest conversation about investing or whatever is on your mind. Send questions, comments, and politely worded criticism, please, to feedback at investorhour.com. I read as many emails as time allows, and I respond to as many as possible. You can also call our listener feedback line, 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. First up this week is Scott B. And Scott says, hey, Dan, first time emailing, but wanted to say I really enjoy the podcast and all the book recommendations. I just finished reading the Doug Casey novels and I'm looking for something new and remembered one of your guests a few months back talking about a fiction book he wrote about China and what is going on over there. Could you tell me the book and author I am trying to think of? Thank you, Scott B. Well, Scott B., I think you're referring to Currency War is the name of the book. And the author of the book is... Lawrence B. Lindsay, L-I-N-D-S-E-Y. That was episode 219, August 12th, 2021. Um, you know, I bought it. I don't, I haven't read it yet. So maybe you could read it and and uh give us give us the lowdown on that. Good question. And uh I, I like I said, I really hope you read the book. Charles L. is up next. Charles L. says, Hi Dan, I follow your podcast from Switzerland since about six months now and appreciate it a lot. What do you think about an investment strategy based on the political orientation of the company or the CEO? If I choose a company with the same political views as me, will it make me hold my positions longer during adverse times? It seems like many great fund managers are following it, like Seth Klarman. So why not do the same? As no ETF is replicating it, may we have an edge in some cases? Thanks for what you do and, and go on. Charles L. Uh, Charles, I think this sounds like a mistake to me, it, but, it, but I also, it, it's nothing that I have experience with, you know, succeeding with it. When I have made investment decisions and, you know, analytical decisions and recommendations based on political movements, um, it's been, it has not gone well. Now, I, I'm going to write about cannabis in the January issue of Extreme Value. But in that case, I, you know, I think being long just makes a lot of sense because it's already legal in a lot of places. And there, you know, there's a lot of legislation going through Congress that will make it even more legal and ho hopefully ultimately legal at the federal level. But that's different than saying that you choose a company based on the political orientation of the CEO. I, I, mm, I'm going to be from Missouri on this one. You're going to have to show me. But thank you. Wade S. is next. Wade says, I'd like to hear your thoughts on Federal Reserve communication. If you listen to the financial press, you hear them talk a lot about forward guidance. Some even try to assign numerical probabilities to various adjectives and verbs in Fed minutes. Uh, the Fed has given a half-year warning about reducing bond purchases halfway to the taper, and people are wondering if the Fed is making a mistake probably because things changed and the Fed really has no idea what the economy will be like in six months. I used to think forward guidance sounded wise. I am beginning to think it causes distortions and people to focus on bureaucrats when they should be focused on price signals. Maybe forward guidance is worse than no guidance at all, Wade S. Yeah, I think forward guidance is worse than no guidance at all. Really good companies tend to 
tend to not do it, most of them. But, you know, it's one of those games that companies play with Wall Street where they say, you know, we expect to earn $2 a share and then, you know, it comes out and it's $2.01 a share and they can say they beat the guidance or something. It's a silly game. Um, and for example, Warren Buffett has opined on this frequently over the years, and that's why Berkshire Hathaway does not do forward guidance. They just report their quarterly earnings and, and move on. It's a silly exercise, and you're right. It, forward guidance is worse than no guidance at all. I agree. And as far as the Fed communication, that's all just, that strikes me as ridiculous, you know. Uh, another thing Buffett has said is, you know, the Fed could whisper every move in my ear before they do it. It would make a damn bit of difference in what I do. And I think that's the right way to look at it. Robert H. is up next. He's an Alliance member, he says. Uh, Hi, Dan. Best wishes for a prosperous new year. Thanks. He goes on here to say, in last week's podcast, you responded to a question about gold's performance by stating that gold's run up a year ago showed that it had done so in anticipation of the jump in inflation. Fair enough. Does that mean that it's dropped since that high is predicted that inflation is not long? Perhaps, dare I say it, transitory? Uh, or is it perhaps an advance notice that the Fed will jump in completely for yield curve suppression and QE set to ludicrous drive? Such indicators tell one everything, only a little of which is true, and that is generally sorted out in hindsight. Sigh. Alliance member and fan of your work, Robert H. Your last comment is really the point, Robert. These indicators tell you everything, most of it in hindsight, and that's the way I look at it. You know, In hindsight, it looks to me like gold anticipated inflation, but who the heck knows? I think most of the price movements of most of these assets are noise. You look in hindsight because you can see the longer term trend, which is gold has outperformed stocks in the 21st century. It's been a 50 bagger since since 1971 when the the cord was cut between gold and the U.S. dollar. And I don't think you need to know a lot else. I think it'll keep doing that. We've been using it for 5,000 years. We'll probably use it for another 5,000. But I'm glad you asked. Next up is Eric H., and Eric H. says, hi, Dan, I love the show and look forward to it every week. I've been thinking about gold and Bitcoin and noticed while they share the same investment thesis, that is currency debasement via runaway monetary and fiscal policies, they trade very differently. Bitcoin appears to be more closely correlated to the NASDAQ while gold plods along. If gold is a risk off asset, is Bitcoin a risk on asset? Happy New Year, Eric H. Well, Eric, certainly our guest today, Mike McClone, talked about this and I asked him about it. And you know what I've said. I've said the same thing. Bitcoin up to this moment and including this moment has traded like a risk on asset. Um, and even gold does that too. You know, when people are selling, you know, as, as Mike pointed out in 2008, they when they were really panicking, they sold gold too and all their stops were hit and it plunged. Um, even though it did finish the bear market in stocks higher than it started, right? So it Sort of, it worked over the long term, but you had to stick with it. And that is the point to me. I think you can stick with both gold and Bitcoin over the long term. In the short term, Bitcoin is still trading risk on. I, and, and I don't know how long it's going to be till Mike McClone's prediction comes true. I think it will come true one day. Will it be 2022, as Mike says? I don't know. We'll find out. Good question, though. And it's good to think about this. Last up this week is Lodovic H. for the first time this year. Lodovic, great to hear from you, and I hope you're doing well. And he says, nothing but the best for the new year, health and success. A few questions. How long would you recommend to research before making any investment? Just a general perspective. Okay, I'll answer these one at a time, Lodovic. So that one, how long, um, that's a really interesting question because... For me, it's changed a lot over the years. It used to take me a lot longer to make a decision because I just didn't have the confidence that I have now. But now I have confidence that I have a process that works. So it, you know, this ongoing process, um, which is a, a model that we use in the Extreme Value newsletter that's mostly maintained by uh, my partner in that endeavor, Mike Barrett. You know, Mike just looks at the model and he says, hey, this stock is a buy according to the model and off we go. So I don't know, how long did it take us to develop all this is, is one way to look at it. So it's a, it's a bit of an odd question. 
But I would think that if you find an as a stock, for example, that appears to be undervalued, you should know whether or not you can achieve a yes or no buy or sell kind of a rating. You know, within a few weeks, I would think at the most, unless you're a real novice, um, and then you know it could take you months and months. Now we have taken months and months with certain businesses, but you know we're kind of dipping in over several months and coming back to it, so it's not quite the same. And like I said, our model now does so much of the work for us that it's almost instant the decision making, and then we collect everything to make a recommendation, and that takes a week or two. So sorry I couldn't give you a better answer than that. That's all I got. Next, Lodovic H says, on gold, no, I'll not move. I consider my gold my financial health policy. Unfortunately, I'll make money on my real-life health care insurance. Um, if I would ask you about the new year, what is the worst investment to make it more interesting? Why? I don't care about the industry. So he's asking me, what, what is the worst bet right now for the new year? And I have to kind of go with Mike. I think we're at a point where the danger that's been in stocks for a couple of years now is starting to become more apparent. And the way people are, you know, they think the Fed is so important when they start to raise interest rates, they start to sell stocks. I don't know why, it's mostly kind of dumb, but they do it. And so if that happens, you could, you know, 2022 could turn into, you know, something like 2018 or worse. So I think it's a bad time to be really excited about making lots of new speculative bets the way people have been doing since the bottom of the COVID bear market in early 2020. I think that would be the worst thing to do is just to keep on cruising the way you were in 2021. Another question, the USA is getting to midterm elections. How can I invest in the elections and make money? Boom. Stop right there. You, 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 you went on. There's more of a question there, but I'm just going to stop right there and say, I don't invest this way, and and I don't recommend that anyone else do so. It's just, it's too difficult. It's the connection from, you know, voting and, you know, what candidates say they're going to do and whether or not they get elected all the way to the bottom line of some individual business. That's There's too much distance there, and it's too complicated in between. All right. So that's why I just don't do politics when it comes to investing. And then I guess I can ignore the rest of your email. And then you finished up with nothing but the best Lodovic H. So thanks, Lodovic. It's good to hear from you. I like to hear your questions. And I hope we'll hear many more of them in 2022. That's another mailbag. And that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. We provide a transcript for every episode. Just go to www.investorhour.com. Click the episode you want. Scroll all the way down. Click on the word transcript and enjoy. If you like this episode and know anybody who might enjoy listening to the show, tell them to check it out on their podcast app or at InvestorHour.com. Do me a favor, subscribe to the show on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And while you're there, help us grow with a rate and a review. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Our handle is at InvestorHour. On Twitter, our handle is at Investor underscore Hour. Have a guest you want me to interview? Drop me a note, feedback at InvestorHour.com or call the listener feedback line 800-381-2357. Tell us what's on your mind and hear your voice on the show. Till next week, I'm Dan Ferris. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. To access today's notes and receive notice of upcoming episodes, go to InvestorHour.com and enter your email. Have a question for Dan? Send him an email feedback at InvestorHour.com. This broadcast is for entertainment purposes only and should not be considered personalized investment advice. Trading stocks and all other financial instruments involves risk. You should not make any investment decision based solely on what you hear. Stansberry Investor Hour is produced by Stansberry Research and is copyrighted by the Stansberry Radio Network. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansberry Research, its parent company, or affiliates. You should not treat any opinion expressed on this program as a specific inducement to make a particular investment or follow a particular strategy, but only as an expression of opinion. Neither Stansbury Research nor its parent company or affiliates warrant the completeness or accuracy of the information expressed on this program, and it should not be relied upon as such. 
Standard Research, its affiliates and subsidiaries are not under any obligation to update or correct any information provided on the program. The statements and opinions expressed on this program are subject to change without notice. No part of the contributor's compensation from Stansbury Research is related to the specific opinions they express. Past performance is not indicative of future results. Stansbury Research does not guarantee any specific outcome or profit. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this program. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this program may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as a recommendation that is appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this program. Before acting on information on the program, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor.